In the previous two videos of this series, I've argued that the film Gettysburg would have benefited enormously from a much more focused and cohesive plot. I appreciate that Gettysburg has more educational value than most historical fiction films out there, but at the end of the day, education or dramatization is not the purpose of narrative filmmaking. Storytelling is. I get the sense that director Ron Maxwell and financier Ted Turner didn't just want to make any old Civil War movie, they wanted to make the greatest, longest, most lavish Civil War movie ever. But when you let ambition get in the way of telling a good story, I think you do yourself a disservice as a filmmaker. But I also understand that Ron Maxwell has a very different idea of what makes a good movie than I do. He seems very concerned with making films that are completely separate from the cultural or political winds of the day. I would argue that he fails at that with Gods and Generals, which presents a mythological version of the Civil War which has always been inherently political. I'd further argue that it's impossible to completely uncouple your work as an artist from the world around you. We are all products of our time, and it affects nearly every aspect of our lives. But with Gettysburg, Maxwell came as close as he ever did to achieving this goal. For all its imperfections, there is a timeless quality about it. I think Maxwell spends a lot of time thinking about his artistic philosophy, time that might be better spent thinking about how he wants to shoot or edit a scene. Other filmmakers are into answering questions, and we need all kind of filmmakers. I believe uh, uh, my role as a filmmaker is to pose questions. Okay, Ron, but where do you want us to put the camera? It takes a kind of a surrender. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean a surrender of the ego. Uh, that's great, Ron, but what lens should we use for the shot? Start with your compass. Some call it a moral compass. Some call it an aesthetic compass. But uh, All right, Ron, but what's my character's objective in this scene? You have to feel that you are the unique storyteller in the world to tell this story. It's got to be that much of an imperative. Sure, Ron, but do you want this cut to begin here or three frames sooner? I would suggest that 30% of filmmaking is artistic and 70% is technical. And I don't think that Ron Maxwell really appreciates that there's a science to his art. And while Gettysburg is artistically timeless, it's technically very dated. Which brings us to Pickett's Charge. I really don't like this scene. But then again, maybe we should back up a little bit to the small hours of July the 3rd 1863. At midnight, General Meade held a council of war in his headquarters. His corps commanders unanimously agreed that the army should retain its current position and not go on the offensive. At the meeting, Meade is said to have predicted that Lee would attack his center on the following day. But at first light, he was seemingly proven wrong when fighting once again erupted on Culp's Hill. Ewell's corps renewed their assault seven more times before finally being beaten back with heavy losses. Hundreds of trees were shattered in cannon and musket fire throughout the battle, which lasted all morning. If you'll remember, Stuart's brigade of Confederate infantry the previous night had captured some key Union positions. During the morning's fighting, those positions were lost. Neither Longstreet nor Hill's corps were ready to attack yet. Once again, a lack of Confederate coordination had derailed Lee's plans, and now the Union right was stronger and better entrenched than ever. Confederate hopes for victory now hinged on one final desperate gamble. Lee decided that after a massive artillery barrage, Longstreet would attack the Union center at Cemetery Ridge. Simultaneously, Jeb Stuart's cavalry would swing in from the east and strike Meade in the rear. Famously, Longstreet was very nervous about the idea, and the movie portrays this very well, with many scenes and moments lifted directly from Longstreet's memoirs. Pickett said, General, shall I advance? The effort to speak the order failed, and I could only indicate it by an affirmative bow. He accepted the duty with seeming confidence of success, leaped on his horse, and rode gaily to command. I also like how much suspense there is leading up to the charge. By the time the bombardment starts, I'm always really worked up. My blood's pumping. I'm ready for some action, and then... General Armistead, sir! My compliments! There are boys here from Norfolk, Portsmouth, small hamlets along the James River. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of these speeches. I'll be into what's happening in the movie, and then somebody will go on about the cause, and uh, what it means to be American, and... Uh, oh, God. Here we go. Armistead's monologue to Colonel Fremantle completely deflates the tension for me. We don't get any new information. It serves no purpose for the plot. He emphasizes how dangerous Pickett's charge will be and how brave his men are, but we know that already. Longstreet and Lee have been talking about that for 45 minutes. The only speech I like is Chamberlain's one from the beginning, when he's trying to get the main mutineers back on side, mainly because the speech serves a function in the story. Chamberlain has an actual objective here and his compassion toward these mutineers tells us a lot about who he is as a person. Many of the speeches are taken directly from the book, but in the book you understand what's going on in the characters' heads, and they just work better for me in that context. Again, just kind of a personal preference thing. 
For example, in Chamberlain's speech, Michael Shara describes how, how embarrassed he feels, how corny and hollow his own words sound to him. And eventually, his emotion just takes over and he gets carried away, and so by the end he's speaking from the heart. Jeff Daniels does a wonderful job delivering this monologue, but I resent how the movie takes this complex moment and dumps it down by slapping inspiring music over it. No man born to royalty, here we judge you by what you do not by who your father was. The writing and the performance are good enough. I don't need a musical cue to tell me to feel inspired. I don't know, wouldn't it be classier if the score were just silent here? In any case, the frequent detours into pontification bring the plot to a grinding halt again and again, for no discernible reason. And it's a shame, because they're wonderfully performed. But the phrase, kill your darlings, comes to mind. Most of the speeches could be left on the cutting room floor, and I think the movie would be better for it. For example, Armistead's speech, it's, you know, fine, but it takes up precious time that could be used showing us more of that dope-ass artillery barrage. I know everybody loves this little moment from Hancock. There are times when a corps commander's life does not count. But I feel like this scene could be way more intense. Though most of the Confederate shells overshot the line, sometimes by miles. Hey fellas, you notice how that Rev artillery always overshoot? It was still the largest artillery barrage in the history of the continent, by God. My favorite first-hand account of this bombardment is by Lieutenant Frank Haskell, who was on Cemetery Ridge that afternoon. We thought that at Second Bull Run, at Antietam and at Fredericksburg on the 11th of December, we had heard heavy cannonading. They were but holiday salutes compared with this. Besides the great ceaseless roar of the guns, which was but the background of the others, a million various minor sounds engaged the ear. The projectiles shriek long and sharp. They hiss, they scream, they growl, and they sputter. All sounds of life and rage, and each has its different note, and all are discordant. We saw a man coming up from the rear with his full knapsack on, and some canteens of water held by the straps in his hands. He was walking slowly and with apparent unconcern, though the iron hailed around him. A shot struck the knapsack, and it, and its contents, flew thirty yards in every direction, the knapsack disappearing like an egg, thrown spitefully against a rock. The soldier stopped and turned about in puzzled surprise, put up one hand to his back to assure himself that the knapsack was not there, and then walked slowly on again unharmed not even with his coat torn. That would have been a great moment to include, but I understand that something like that probably would have been beyond Gettysburg's budget. Don't get me wrong, I am very, very impressed, legitimately, with how far the producers took that 20 million. But nonetheless, a lot of the battle scenes just feel kind of rushed and choppy. Like, they didn't get all the shots they wanted and had to salvage it in editing with mixed results. You'd think that a movie called Gettysburg would make an effort to produce some memorable battle scenes. But action sequences like the cannonade and Pickett's Charge are really where the small budget starts to become a big problem. It seems clear to me that a conscious effort was made to emulate the battle scenes in Waterloo, but Waterloo feels more sure-handed to me. Literally! And I feel like there might be another missed opportunity here, specifically regarding East Cavalry Field. Around the same time the cannonade began, about three miles east of the main battlefield, Jeb Stuart's cavalry encountered a much smaller force of United States cavalry under General David Gregg. Stuart, being Stuart, ordered a dramatic charge to sweep aside the Federal skirmishers. So Gregg ordered this asshole, Brigadier General George Armstrong Custer, to send forward one of the Michigan regiments under his command to counterattack. Custer, being Custer, led the attack himself, shouting to his men, Come on, you Wolverines! The two charges collided. It was like the old days. Guys on horses fucking butchering each other with swords. The 34th Virginia Cavalry, a murderous band of irregulars led by a beautifully psychotic bushwhacker named Colonel Vincent Witcher, fought dismounted at the Rummel Farm at East Cavalry Field, fighting the Yankees hand-to-hand -hand or at point-blank range. Witcher later wrote about the casualties that his regiment had sustained. I shall never, no never, forget that eventful night when accompanied by one courier, my adjutant Edwards and Sergeant Major, both being wounded, I, full of grief and bitterness, rode to the barns in Aurea and saw with tears in my eyes my brave fellows from away over the mountains in West Virginia laid out in windrows, torn and bleeding. I shall never forget that night, or the next morning's parade, when I could muster but 96 enlisted men. Brave fellows, not a slaveholder among them. Eventually, Stuart's charge failed. He was unable to drive the Federals from the field, and the Union rear was secure from cavalry attack. This was by no means the most crucial part of the Battle of Gettysburg, and I don't blame Maxwell at all for not including it. But still, it would have been cool to do like a Return of the Jedi type thing, you know, where we cut between Pickett's Charge and East Cavalry Field, and see the Confederate strategy slowly start to unravel. To the west, Lee was blissfully unaware that his plan for a hammer and anvil attack had died in its crib. And at about 3 p.m., the divisions of Johnston Pettigrew, Isaac Trimble, and George Pickett began marching deliberately towards Cemetery Ridge. Little did these men know that 130 years later, their courage and sacrifice would be immortalized in the form of what's, in my opinion, one of the crappiest battle scenes ever. I think the Pickett's Charge scene is just awful. 
I'd go so far as to say that it's borderline offensive to the memories of the men who died in it. I'm serious as fucking cancer. I said this before in my Gods and Generals review, but it bears repeating. You cannot authentically depict the battles of the Civil War without showing a grotesque, disgusting, egregious, gratuitous, gross, ghastly, filthy, wanton, sordid, horrible, sickening, nauseating amount of violence. Oh fuck, I dropped my thesaurus. This might be Gettysburg's biggest flaw, both in terms of artistic and historical value. A Civil War movie isn't doing its job unless I'm barfing into my popcorn bag and Gettysburg falls woefully short of this sublime standard. Instead, the violence is sanitized, or worse, heroic, with the same triumphant Randy Edelman cue playing over every charge. And you know, the score of Gettysburg is a great piece of music on its own, but in the context of the film, it annoys me how much it seems to venerate the act of large numbers of men brutally murdering one another. Now I figure the aim with including the score like this was to glorify the bravery of the soldiers, not war itself. But wouldn't that point be driven home more if we saw firsthand just how unbelievably violent Civil War combat really was? To be fair, I'm sure the small budget didn't do the special effects and makeup teams any favors, but you can't say that this film was flaccidly bloodless just because they originally shot it for TV. Gods and Generals had a much bigger budget, was shot for a theatrical run, and it has this problem too. The movie spent the better part of an hour building suspense for this charge, and again, most of that stuff is great. We've heard all about how this is basically a death sentence for Pickett's division. Several times, we've seen Longstreet express his doubts and fears. We've seen men like Kemper and Armistead rise to the moment, nobly going to certain death because they have a duty to their men. And then the battle starts. <sighs> it just doesn't look that dangerous, and these reenactors have these sort of bored expressions on their faces. They're not terrified or livid. They look like they're wondering what the catering crew is going to serve for lunch. They might as well be running through their drills for a school group at a living history encampment. Come on guys, put the acting in reenacting. This is why I, I don't think that reenactors should be extras in major motion pictures. If it's a low budget thing, then yeah, I mean, totally. But if you've got enough money to actually hire extras, get some 22 year olds right out of drama school. You know, people who can actually act and who actually kind of look the part, look like Civil War soldiers. Reenactors should 100% be listened to. They should be there as historical consultants. They should vet all the uniforms. They should make sure that everything looks good and that everything's true to the period. But uh, get the kids out of drama school, please. Whitewashing violence in a war movie doesn't just make for dull viewing. It trivializes the suffering of the actual soldiers who fought and died in that war. Now, I'm not saying that violence in movies can never be fun. Because it's so much fun, Chan! Get it! Or that every war movie has to be unrelentingly grim. But as a filmmaker, you need to be very careful about unintentionally glorifying armed conflict. And Pickett's charge was an absolute bloodbath. Before the assault even began, Union artillery from Cemetery Ridge tore through the ranks of Confederate infantry as they cowered under trees on Cemetery Ridge. When they finally emerged onto open ground, Federal gunners could start picking their targets, and the bombardment became even more destructive, taking off heads, limbs, and boring holes in chest cavities. As the advancing rebels came into range of the batteries positioned on Little Round Top, they were exposed to enfilading fire, meaning that Union gunners could shoot 12-pound cast iron balls down the entire length of an enemy column, mowing down dozens of men at a time. Faced with this horrendous fate, whole Confederate regiments broke and ran, colliding with their comrades advancing from behind, sowing confusion and chaos as the iron rain continued. The charge faltered as Confederate infantry struggled to cross the fences at the Emmitsburg Road, about halfway to Cemetery Ridge. Those who did make it over the fences with their lives came within rifle range, and United States troops fired in four ranks, offering an unrelenting hail of 50 to 60 caliber soft lead bullets that sometimes exploded as they passed through the body, ripping through internal organs like tissue paper. A few hundred Confederates reached the stone wall that protected the Union line, but they were easily outflanked and quickly repulsed at the points of swords, knives, and bayonets. By the end, the angle was soaked in blood and viscera, to say nothing of the thousands of dead and wounded that littered the fields for a mile to the west. When some pimply 17-year-old from North Carolina got his guts torn out by shrapnel and felt the world go dark as he stared at a patch of grass and shat himself, he did not hear Randy Edelman's rousing score in the background. He just fucking died. You know, back in the summer of 2013, when I lived and worked at Gettysburg, I took part in this uh, Pickett's Charge walk on uh, uh, 3 p.m. on July 3rd, the 150th anniversary. 
and it was led by these park rangers carrying big flags. It was all divided up into the three uh, uh, brigades of Pickett's division. You know, we had um, uh, uh, we were in Armisteads. Uh, everybody, of course, wanted to be in Armisteads because you know of this fucking movie <laughs> and uh, Garnet and Kemper's and. Uh, it was stupid. I mean, <laughs> there's a horde of tourists behind us taking selfies, complaining about the heat, and we were standing next to these very surly, hardcore reenactors. And of course, we were in our shitty, farby Confederate costumes. I'm sure they thought we looked really stupid. But uh, I actually had a GoPro strapped to my head, so, you know, very authentic. But the whole thing was just, it was ridiculous. People were quoting lines from the movie. People were saying, Virginia! You know, it's just dumb. But as we got marching, I couldn't help but feel it, you know? Really feel it. By the time we got to the Emmitsburg Road, I was screaming Virginia and doing the rebel yell and it was covered in sweat, my voice was hoarse. And we neared Cemetery Ridge and, you know, from a mile back on Cemetery Ridge, I mean, you can't even see a line of people. Uh, they're, they're just ants in Cemetery Ridge, you can't even see them. As you get closer, though, you know, the crowd of Union reenactors and tourists on Cemetery Ridge it just grew larger and larger and larger. And by the time we got to the stone wall, I had just been thinking for however long it was, 20, 30 minutes, however long it took us to walk across that field, I was just thinking about what it would have been like to be a part of that. Kind of like that Faulkner quote, you know, about... Uh, there isn't a southerner alive who hasn't thought about what it would be like to cross that field on that day. And I got pretty choked up. And I remember uh, reaching the stone wall. It was around um, the 57th Pennsylvania Monument, I think. I could be wrong, but I think it was. And there was this Union reenactor that I was passing by. I looked at this dude. He had tears in his eyes. And we just stared at each other for a second. And then he extended his hand. and I shook it. And he said something like, I'm glad you're here. And I know that's cornier than a Ron Maxwell movie, but uh, I'll never forget that. So, I've been bitching and moaning about this movie for God knows how long. I'm so bad. But I haven't actually offered up an overall concrete suggestion for how I would fix Gettysburg. And I'm not going to. I'm leaving it up to you. I'm calling upon the good people of the internet to make a fan edit of Gettysburg. It'll be called the 20th Maine. It'll start here, with the whole drama about the Maine mutineers. We can leave this speech in, because it's kind of essential to the narrative. Then we see him marching and stuff. I would prefer you cut out this speech, but I know a lot of people think it's the bee's knees, so I'll leave that up to you. Keep all the little round top stuff, of course, and also keep the scene where Chamberlain talks to Hancock about Armistead, just so we know who the fuck he is. Buster dies, blah blah blah, cut Pickett's charge down to like a five minute sequence, and when Tom asks the wounded Armistead his name, and he's like, tell General Hancock, the General Armistead sends his regrets. It'll be a big reveal like, oh shit, that's him. And keep the end the same with the brothers embracing as the sun sets. I want it cut down to a crisp 90 minutes, people. Get to it.